If not, I will turn it over to Molly, who is going to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Michael. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ava Fisher today. Um, Ava started her PhD in Kim Hook's lab at Colorado State University, where I also did my PhD in the same lab. We were the only two graduate students there, but Ava really she came first, so she is the burnt pancake. Um, and I think you'll see today that uh, she is a, a light for anyone in the room who's feeling like a burnt pancake as a graduate student in a lab. She has had great success. Um, and so she did her work on Trinidadian guppies, and she also helped found that system at Colorado State University with a number of other researchers. She worked on something that I think we all find very intimidating, the brain. She worked on the underlying genetic and neural uh, networks that really pattern variation in behavior. And her whole dissertation centered around plasticity, which I think she'll talk about today. Uh, then she moved, after graduating, to the O'Connell Lab, Lauren O'Connell Labs uh, at Harvard, where Lauren was a Bauer fellow, and you were also her first postdoc. Second. Second, OK. Second by a small margin, I think. Um, she also helped found the research in that lab, this time on frogs. Um, I would like to think I had something to do with her moving to frogs, but in reality it was um, this really intriguing variation in parental care behaviors that she also wanted to look at the underlying genetic and neural networks that really pattern that variation in behavior. Um, and she's had great success, also done a ton of field work everywhere from <clears throat> South America to Madagascar. Uh, I think there was at least one year in Boston where Ava spent more time in the field than actually at her home or close to it. Um, so she's really accomplished a lot in her postdoc and now she's moved to Stanford where she's been for the last few years. She's been mostly funded off of an NSF postdoc fellowship during that time uh, and she'll be starting her own lab which it seems will be easy for her given she's helped start two labs already. Uh, she'll be at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign and I believe she's still recruiting graduate students and postdocs. Um, so before I turn it over, I'll just say that if you're interested in the areas of research that Ava covers, um, I highly encourage you to contact her because it's hard to think of someone who has uh, had a stronger impact in kind of strengthening my, my intellectual merit and creativity as a researcher while serving as a consistent guidepost of how to navigate academia and the broader world with personal integrity and kindness. So um, with that. Yeah, thank you, um, Molly, for that very kind introduction. If you're interested in my lab, you can also ask Molly. She will tell you all the secrets because she knows them all. I hope she won't tell you all of them, actually. Um, and also, thank you for the invitation. It's really delightful to be here, sort of close by um, Stanford, where I am now, um, and also with a crew of people who, some of whom I knew already or know, and um, lots of people doing really cool things who I've gotten to meet and will meet somewhere this afternoon. So um, I'm going to start really big by saying that I'm really broadly interested in how behavioral diversity is generated and maintained, both within and among species. And something that has always struck me about behavior is that we see really different kinds of critters exhibit similar kinds of behavior. So aggressive kinds of behaviors, mating and courtship kinds of behaviors, and parental or other affiliative kinds of behaviors. But of course, obviously, at the same time that there's this broad scale overlap, there's incredible diversity in the kinds of adaptations animals have to perform these behaviors, um, the kinds of cues they integrate to decide when and if to perform them. Um, and so this like push-pull between broad scale overlap on the one hand and this incredible diversity on the other, for me personally, has always led me to wonder, well, do shared or distinct mechanisms give rise to similar behaviors? Or so another way of saying this, how flexible are that mechanism's underlying behavior? Does evolution build similar behaviors sort of repeatedly using the same building blocks? Or are systems flexible such that you can um, have multiple given solutions, if you will, to some adaptive problem? And so 
I'm framing this here in the context of behavior because I happen to really like behavioral traits. Um, but this is, of course, a really broad biological question um, that we could apply to any trait of interest. Um, and I think it's also a question about the kinds of mechanisms that bias developmental and evolutionary trajectories into certain channels. Um, and of course, there are people in this room who have addressed this and are continuing to address this in really beautiful and elegant ways. Um, and there's multiple ways, I think, to start to think about this. But um, as Molly already alluded to, one way that I've thought about this, um, both as a graduate student and now as a postdoc, is thinking about it through the lens of how phenotypic plasticity interacts with evolution and maybe influences um, patterns of evolution and adaptation. And so, of course, this is a place where, again, there's a very large and really cool literature, and there's lots of various ideas out there. I think um, recently there have also been some really nice empirical studies, which were lacking for a long time. I and mean, I'm just citing like a very few examples here. And I want to just set up really briefly um, one area of this really broad and cool literature that's going to be really relevant to what I'm going to tell you about today. So if we imagine, right, we have some trait value on the x, that could be continuous, that could be discrete, and then we have some environment on the y, could also be continuous, could also be discrete. Um, but broadly classifying this, we can think about environments as being ancestral and then derived. And so animals may enter a new or derived environment either because wherever they are is changing due to something like climate change or because they're actually colonizing some novel place. And so what happens, right? Okay, so in your ancestral environment, maybe it's really great to be a medium-sized green dot. Um, you are well adapted to um, be successful, to reproduce, to survive in that environment. In a new environment, there's likely some new optimal trait value. And perhaps it's better to be smaller and yellow, uh, to avoid predation, to attract mates under new light conditions, what have you, right? Um, and so what happens when these green dots move into a new novel environment and um, reproduce there? So one option is that as soon as they enter or their offspring enter this new environment, they make it all the way to this new trait optimum. So they just completely shift and are able to look optimal in a new environment without any genetic change. Another option is that you get part of the way there. So you're looking smaller and yellower, but you're not at the optimum value yet. And so this is what we typically think of as plasticity that's happening in an adaptive direction, moving you closer to the new optimum. Or you end up in this new environment, it's total chaos, um, you turn large and blue, which is not adaptive at all, and so this would be plasticity in a non-adaptive direction, taking you further from the new optimum. And so if this is what happens plastically, um, we can then think about, okay, well, what do we expect to happen in terms of subsequent selection? And so in the first case, we tend to talk about plasticity then as shielding you from selection, right? You get there without any genetic change to the new phenotypic optimum, and so selection doesn't really have anything to act on. But in these other two cases, the expectation is that the effects of selection should, over time, get you to the new trait optimum. And so what's important for today's talk is that there's been, there have been, there continue to be um, conflicting or sort of contrary ideas about what roles adaptive versus non-adaptive plasticity play in this process of um, facilitating adaptation. And so there's two basically contrasting or complementary ideas depending on how grouchy you feel about these topics. Um, and so in the first case of adaptive plasticity, this is sort of the most classic idea. Um, I was talking with someone this morning about the Baldwin effect. The idea is, okay, plasticity gets you part of the way there, and then there can be somehow co-option or assimilation of whatever mechanisms took you in the right direction to get you the rest of the way to the optimum. Um, and then the other idea is that it actually may be non-adaptive plasticity that facilitates adaptation because moving that far away from the optimum actually increases the strength of selection to sort of like create a hard push back towards the optimum. Um, and so there are examples out there in the literature of both these things and so in some ways the, the jury is still out or like both of these things appear to matter, but it's not clear when and why. Um, and so I'm going to tell you today um, a little bit about uh, ways that I've been thinking about this with my own work. So I'm going to tell you two stories today. Um, the first is going to be about fish. 
Um, thinking about plasticity, evolution, and transcriptional mechanisms of parallel adaptation. So this is um, guppy work still that I started in graduate school and have not managed to entirely break up with yet, for better or for worse. Um, and the second part, I'm going to talk about um, my more recent post postdoctoral work in frogs <coughs> and thinking about behavioral and plasticity in parental care, which is also going to be sort of an expansion of the way that I've been thinking about some of these questions more recently. Okay, so as a graduate student, I worked on these wonderful little critters here, Trinidadian guppies. So the males are smaller and brightly colored, the females are larger and drab. These are small, live-bearing freshwater fish. They have been spread all over the world, uh, both in the pet trade and um, in the wild, in feral populations. Uh, but it's here in Trinidad that they exist in what's been termed a natural laboratory. And it's specifically in the northern range mountains of Trinidad. So, or in the river drainages, rather, uh, of these northern range mountains. So if we zoom in on one of these, or a subset of these river drainages, we have this very classic setup that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, at lower elevations and higher order streams, we have what are classically referred to as high predation sites. Here, guppies coexist with a whole host of predators that prey intensely on them. Um, as we move upstream, there are waterfall barriers that the, uh, that the predators cannot cross. And so upstream of these barriers, we have what are classically referred to as low predation sites. And here, guppies are more or less living the good life. And so um, it's been known for many, many years, decades, uh, that what this has given rise to is repeated evolutionary transitions and parallel adaptive phenotypes. And because people have been working on this system for decades, we have a really good sense of what the adaptive phenotypes are, both in terms of behavior, morphology, physiology. Um, so for me, a great place to start. Lots of background data. No one had looked at a brain. Um, and then we also know from the genetics that these are repeated colonizations. So it's always a high predation um, source population colonizing a low predation environment rather than like lateral movement low to low. And so it's in essence then like a naturally replicated experiment. Um, what we then did more recently as part of the um, Colorado State Guppy Group, which was a sort of collection of labs working on this from different angles, was to take advantage of a breeding design to try to tease apart, okay, when we see this parallel um, trait <coughs> evolution, how much of that is actually genetic and how much of it is, is plastic, is environmentally mediated. And so to do this, we bring in fish from the wild. So every river drainage, drainage is its own evolutionary lineage, basically, because we have this high to low colonization event. We can bring in these two populations. Um, we rear them out two generations to try and control as best we can for maternal and environmental effects. And then we split when they're born second generation fish into rearing environments with and without predators. So this is essentially a two by two design, right? So you end up with four experimental groups in essence. And so when I use the word group throughout the talk, this is what I refer to. Um, I want to just briefly point out, okay, what do I mean by re these rearing environments? So we house the fish in these recirculating water systems. So there's a sump tank down here, and water is constantly <coughs> moving through these smaller tanks. And in the um, predator treatment, we house a pike cichlid in that sump tank, and it gets fed guppies daily. So from birth throughout their lives, throughout the duration of this experiment, these guppies um, in the predator treatment are constantly being exposed to chemical cues um, from the predator directly, and we think also um, from the predator eating their buddies, basically. Um, and so how do we interpret this then? So if we compare um, animals that are from different populations in the same rearing environment, so this is like a classic common garden kind of design, we assume most of the differences we're seeing there are genetically um, mediated. And then by contrast, if we compare between um, siblings split into these different rearing environments, we assume that most of what we're seeing now is developmentally mediated. It's not perfect, they're not clonal, um, but we do have this nice uh, split brood design so we can control um, to some extent for the genetics here. And so we know that the fish know that the predator is there uh, because myself and others um, 
have put out a number of different studies looking at differences in behavioral, morphological, and life history traits, and we know they're based on a combination of genetic and developmental effects of predation. So this was super exciting. These studies here are largely like sort of organismal level traits, but for me, I was also starting grad school at a really exciting time because like all of the genomic transcriptomic approaches were totally exploding, and so as someone who thinks about underlying mechanisms but who likes funny critters, uh, this was super exciting. Um, and then the other thing in terms of this question specifically about plasticity and these kinds of patterns is that it takes a ton of time, right, to collect metabolic data, to measure color, to measure shoaling behavior. And then at the end of that, you sort of have like one trait to think about these patterns in. And so, um, of course, thinking of individual genes as traits or phenotypes is a little bit odd, but I think it's cool because it lets us think about how we can look at these patterns in hundreds or thousands of things rather than just one trait at a time. And so um, we can argue later about genes as traits, but that's what I'm, the rest of the data I'm going to show you in terms of the guppies is sort of using that kind of an approach to think about these patterns. So the first study that I want to show you is one that um, I was involved in, though it was not sort of directly part of my work, looking specifically at rapid evolution in gene expression. So what do I mean by this, right? So here's our basic setup, remember? And what we piggybacked off of was that there had been these experimental introductions where high predation fish from this source were introduced into different locations in the low predation environment, and they were monitored um, in these earliest stages of adaptation to this new environment. Um, and then we asked about adaptive versus non-adaptive um, patterns of gene expression, or of plastic gene expression in relation to um, adaptation to this, genetic adaptation to this environment. So to be able to do this, um, we did sequencing of whole brains and looked at gene expression. And the first thing we did was to compare um, in these pairwise comparisons. So we always have our ancestral high predation population. We have the long established low predation pair to it. And then we have these two introductions, which are a year into being in a low predation environment. By overlapping um, these comparisons, we can ask, well, which genes are always different be between high and low? Um, and there is 136 <coughs> of them, as it turns out. Uh, this may not seem like a very large number, but this is way more overlap than expected by chance. And so the idea was like, okay, these are the genes that always change in response to being in a low predation environment. Um, from a genetic standpoint, these are genetic or from our common garden, right, genetic differences. So what can we say then about what's happening with plastic expression changes in these genes? And so the way I'm going to show you this data, and we're going to do this a few more times through the talk, so I want to orient you really clearly. So I'm basically going to plot log fold expression changes um, for these various genes or transcripts. And in this case, we've got on the y-axis evolved expression difference. So this is, we're assaying this by looking at fish in the, um, from different populations in the same rearing condition. And then we're going to compare that to plastic expression divergence. So thinking about what happens with the ancestral population when they're reared with and without predators. Boop, there's our little guy. Um, and so when we see things that fall along this axis, those are transcripts that are either going up in both cases or down in both cases, but they're moving in the same direction genetically and plastically. And so this is how we're defining then that we assume these are, this represents adaptive plasticity. And then by contrast, going along this other diagonal, um, they're moving in opposite directions, and so we interpret this as being, representing non-adaptive plasticity. And so what do we actually see if we plot these 136 genes that we have strong evidence for that they're involved in adaptation? Um, so what I think you can probably eyeballometrically assess and what is true from the statistics <laughs> is that there's way more stuff um, on this diagonal so there's this strong signature of non-adaptive plasticity in these genes that appear to be important for adaptation to low predation. So this was super exciting. Um, we were very excited about this. Our interpretation of it in general was that non-adaptive plasticity appears to potentiate rapid adaptation to low predation environments. 
Um, and I should also say that one of the reasons guppies were so awesome for this is because we know that they are very rapidly adapting. Like, they are really good at adapting to new environments um, and doing so quickly. So this was sort of um, a study that I was involved in early on. And then in the bulk of my dissertation work, I felt like, OK, well, there's two other um, questions here that I would like to answer. One is, well, what about longer time scales, right? Is there something fundamentally different about rapid adaptation versus adaptation that's happening um, many, many generations out? And what about these independent evolutionary lineages? Because here, even though we had multiple populations, they're all coming from the same source. So it's a single genetic lineage um, with multiple colonizations, one natural and two artificial. So I took advantage of the same experimental design that I've already told you. In my case, I took mature males, um, specifically males because uh, Data I'm not showing you, though happy to discuss with anyone. I also looked, I assayed a bunch of different behaviors, and only the males exhibit things like courtship and aggression. And then I collected their brains for whole brain RNA-seq, <coughs> de novo transcriptome assembly, and gene expression analysis. And so here is a guppy brain on a penny, just to give you a sense of the <laughs> massive tissues that I was working with here. Um, so the first thing I did was, again, this like relatively standard kind of differential gene expression analysis, comparing now I have two drainages. Um, oh, I should have pointed that out here. So two drainages, not just one, two lineages. OK, so some number of genes is differentially expressed based on population. Not surprising. Some number of genes is differentially expressed based on developmental differences. <laughs> Not surprising, right? What I really wanted to know is, is there a relationship between these two things? And so if we overlap these, um, there are some genes that are differentially expressed based on both influences. And once again, this is more overlap than expected by chance. Um, so this is exciting to me because this means there is some non-independence on whether you end up differentially expressed in a genetic and or a developmental aplastic way. Um, so what about direction, right? So I'm going to show you these data in a really similar way to what I showed you before. And they look like this. And now what you can probably eyeballometrically assess is there does not look like there's a pattern here. And that is in fact true. There is no association between plastic expression divergence and um, genetic differences. What the heck? Right? Mm -hmm. So, like three minutes ago, I just told you non-adaptive plasticity is really important. And now I'm like, oh, there's no pattern. Um, what's going on? Okay, so what's the main difference here? This data set on the left, this rapid adaptation data set, represents basically three to four guppy generations. It's a year after colonization. Whereas on the right-hand side, these are high and low predation pairs that are long established. So we're looking at something like two million generations. And so what I think is cool here, then, is that this suggests that maybe the role of adaptive versus non-adaptive plasticity differs across time scales. And I think if we think about this, there's actually, this is maybe relatively intuitive, that at the earliest stages, the really non-adaptive responses, there is hard selective pressure to move those closer to the optimum. But as you get rid of those most extremely non-adaptive phenotypes, <coughs> you might lose that kind of a strong signature. And the reason that I think this is also particularly neat is that um, there's a lot of debate surrounding this what's important, adaptive or non-adaptive, and there's examples of both things in the literature. And so I think both of those things are valid, and so how can we begin <coughs> to understand why they are both happening and under what sorts of circumstances one or the other is like more or less important. Okay, so that sort of addresses this first question about time scale. Um, what about independent evolutionary lineages? So this is the data I just showed you, um, but now we're going to compare across these two drainages. Um, and so here, sort of a similar story to before, indeed there are some amount of overlap, and it is once again more overlap than expected by chance. And so this is like right, a pretty common thing that people do when they're thinking about parallelism or convergence. Let's find the things that, the underlying mechanistic things that also move in parallel. Um, and those are probably good candidates 
as genes that are likely mediating the parallelism we see at the level of the phenotype. If not, I will turn it over this to This was Molly, also my rationale, right? And so um, I'm going to actually show you the data in a similar way for gene expression to what I did before. But now, um, so it's going to look really similar, but the interpretation is slightly different. Where now we've got evolved divergence in the two drainages on these axes. Um, and so rather than being about plastic or non-plastic, this is just a question of do we have concordant divergence? So, right, we know the phenotypes are parallel. These genes are shared. Are they also moving in a parallel direction? Which is kind of what we would expect if we think that they're driving parallel phenotypic differences. And so she did her work on Or if they're going in opposite directions, right, then we have non-concordant so what do we actually see? Something that I think we all find very interesting. Another brain, totally even distribution all genetic, over the place. And, neural, and so here uh, also there was no really association in behavior. expression direction. And her whole dissertation. So to summarize then the last few things, we'll talk about both brain. within a drainage and, and across drainages, graduating I know from my own lab, data and labs, decades uh, of other Harvard, people's data that there's a lot of parallelism at the level of phenotype. And while we have more overlap in gene identity than expected by chance, there's not any strong association in expression direction. This time on frogs. Um, I would like so to this is not what I expected, right? I frogs, figured I'm going to find more was, parallelism in mechanism, really but variation I actually like think it's pretty cool, cool because to me what this suggests is that there's actually flexibility in transcriptional that mechanisms. And, and so we know, right, that we're getting parallelism in the phenotypic traits at the organismal level, but we're seeing different patterns in these underlying mechanisms. And so does that mean what we're actually looking at is multiple alternative solutions to the same adaptive problem. Um, so she's really and accomplished so a one lot other piece that, that I want to show you that I think speaks Stanford, to this is um, few years if we again go back and look at NSF these multiple uh, populations from the same lineage lab, versus comparing across distinct lineages, here um, we had overlapping genes uh, be the and they have a really strong signature where they are moving in the same direction. We do see concordant expression. Whereas here, um, so our overlap overall, did not show that pattern. Interested in and so I think in thinking <laughs> about um, how many solutions you have and why do you choose one over the other, this suggests to me that standing genetic variation influences those patterns, right? So if you start from the same genetic stock, you're more likely to replay the tape in the same way to get the same um, mechanistic solution. But if you start from a different starting place, there's all sorts of other things happening. There's pleiotropy, there's interactions, there's who knows what. Thank you, um, Molly, for Great. that very so, kind introduction. If you're interested in my lab, you can also ask Molly. She will tell you all the secrets because she knows them all. Okay, so, so to summarize then, um, the first part and also of thank you for you. the invitation. It's um, really delightful to be here. I hope that I've shown you by, the relationship um, between plasticity and adaptation, Stanford, where I am now, um, and these and patterns of parallelism depends on my new already or no background. And to me, what's really exciting here is that I think that both of these things suggest that there's flexibility in transcriptional so, mechanisms. Um, I'm going to start really big and so by saying I think that I'm really broadly interested in how I, I started behavioral talking diversity about is generated and maintained and something both within that, and among species. And, and something that has night, always suppose, struck me uh, is about that, right, is that we see really all different kinds of critters, but exhibit this is really far from this emergent so property of aggressive kinds of behavior. So basically what we're trying to do is mating and courtship kinds of behavior all the way back and parental very, or other like affiliative kinds of behaviors. behaviors. And I think especially but in of the course, brain, obviously at the same time that there's this broad scale overlap, there's, overlap, there's incredible place. diversity um, in the kinds we know of mutations they have to there are really these clear levels of organization. Um, the kinds of cues right? they so integrate to genes, decide when um, if they interact with other genes. They're inside of neurons, um, which are highly so specialized structures in terms of how like, they talk to each other between broad neural overlap network and this incredible diversity and to other for brain regions and those talk to each other and all of this creates this emergent property that is the mechanisms give rise to similar behaviors. 
Or so another way to of saying this, um, how I flexible are the about, well, how can we sort of think about Does evolution what this flexibility build similar <laughs> behaviors or repeatedly using the same and building how that can help us or our systems flexible and more such that you can um, have multiple so, given I mean, solutions, if you will, to some now. adaptive um, problems. And tell you about so, um, <laughs> some of my more recent work. I'm framing this here in the context of behavior because I have to really like behavioral traits. But this is, of course, a really broad biological question that we could apply to any so trait of interest. Um, and I think it's also um, a question about the kinds of mechanisms that, that bias <laughs> developmental <laughs> and evolutionary <laughs> So <laughs> there's three um, characteristics um, and of course there are people in this unifying group. This group and um, as many who advise, they carry defensive chemicals, right? Ways, 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 small um, and there's multiple ways, ways I think they don't to make these things about this, but on their diet, as Molly already alluded to, they have this lovely avosomatic warning coloration, both as a graduate student not delicious is thinking um, about it is also the lens of how of phenotypic healing um, interacts and then with what most people are less aware of though um, I think is not surprising to this particular audience many of these guys have and also so of course this is a place where again there's a very large and Really and so cool in the Eternal Lab, there's lots of various um, ideas out there. I think three of these things um, recently and worked also with some really nice things. empirical studies interfacing for, for a long time. Um, care and, and I'm just citing like a very well, few examples But most here. of what I've done and is I want to set up really care. briefly and the um, one that area of this we got really going broad with parental care cool literature and species, that's going to be so really right, relevant to Parental care in general is phylogenetically very widespread. So if we imagine we have some trait value on the X that animal continuous and it comes and then we have some environment flavors. Why it could also be continuous, could also be discrete, um, but broadly classifying this, and what's neat about the frog environment is that we have ancestral related and then derived. That exhibit and so animal strategy may enter a new and so, um, environment either because wherever we they like are is changing to start to, start to think like climate change or about okay, okay, what's important for parental care um, at a neural level per and se and what's maybe what happens, right? Okay, so in your ancestral environment, maybe it's really great to be a pair bonding dot. You are well adapted to. So, given that um, we're going to talk about successful to reproduce, to survive in that environment, look like um, in a new environment, so unlike likely some new here optimal in trait in general, value. these guys and perhaps it's better to water or they lay yellow them on land uh, to um, avoid they predation, take care to of them, they mates, they hydrate them, light conditions, they, um, in what have you, right? actively defend them. Um, um, and so what so happens when, when tadpoles hatch out, green dots tadpoles move into a new bottle environment so and to get them to water. water. And so this is so perhaps one option is that delightful phase as soon of as they care, enter or their offspring, they get piggyback ride, they make um, it all the way to the stage of being optimal. They just um, completely shift to be able to um, look pools optimal of water. In new and then in some, though not all species, um, Another option is that you get part of the way there. there. So you're uh, looking for smaller and yellower, so but you're not at the optimum value. So, really so this is what we um, typically think sort of, of as plasticity that's happening in an behavior. adaptive direction. Moving um, in closer and to And so the now we're going to watch some videos. Because or I was like, you Molly, this that video had nothing to do with my talk, and she was um, like, you should turn large and blue. So <laughs> we're going to watch one video that's directly so related, related to the toss and the non adaptive direction, sort of taking you further. You're going to do it. <laughs> and okay. so, if this is what so happens, here is in this case, dad, and we can then think about the tadpole and back. And so, this is what transport looks like. So, he's cruising around. There's actually, and so in the first case, we tend to talk about what he's doing and is shielding out whether from where he wants to be. You get there without any genetic change to the scientific optimum. And so selection. Um, so they will really perform this behavior action. for sometimes. But in hours, these other two um, cases, and we know that the expectation they are is that the effects they, we know of selection that, uh, should over are time and get resource. They remember where they are. They will navigate and back so to them. They will check them out. Today's decide, talk like, is, is that there's been or not. There um, have so been this in and of Complex. These are sort of contrary um, ideas about and what then here's the one where I'm not going to talk about egg feeding, this but play um, in I'm this happy process. to talk to you about it later um, if you want to hear about it. This is also a super neat behavior. And so there's so two in this case, mom. Basically, and what you're going to see contrasting is that these tadpoles actually beg their, their mothers for meals. So how do you feel about these topics? Or she? We can't tell. It's vibrating a lot here, and they kind of nibble on mom. And this is a really important cue. So in the absence of warning about the ball, one effect, the idea is okay. Plasticity gets you part of the way. There. We also have and then there can be somehow co-option um, or assimilation or not, of whatever mechanism took you in the right direction that to get you the rest of the need. So these tadpoles are communicating. Um, and then the other idea is, and is that they do it actually be non-adaptive plasticity um, than mom will take eggs. So here is an egg, egg and that, and that far away from the optimum actually increases the strength of selection to sort of like create a hard push. Eggs are great, right? Like basically every organism likes to eat eggs. They're little protein. There are examples out there in the literature 
those both have these things cool and so in some ways to the, to do this they're modified so out or like both um, of these things and, and some of these species but it's are also obligate why um, and so i'm going to tell you today nothing um, um as a little bit about other than eggs uh, from ways that so i've been thinking about this elaborate um costly parental obesity so i'm going to tell you two stories today um, the first um, is going to be a fish. That concludes the video. Um, thinking right. about plasticity, <laughs> evolution, and So, as I mentioned to you, um, we thought this was so a really is, great system um, to start to try to figure out that I, what's important for parental care across these sexes. And so, this is like one slide that is like four years of my life. And the second part, I'm going to talk about So that's always sobering. Where we didn't know how to get it thinking about behavioral and And so, basically, what we did is that we identified core brain sort of an expansion of the way that I don't care. Across sexes and species. And some of these are also brain regions that okay. we know. So, as a graduate student, I work on so this was really exciting um, here to the dating and because we had males are smaller and that there would be the females uh, are larger. Conservation here here of these are small mechanisms, live bearing um, freshwater no fish. In the they have been spread all over the um, world. And then we uh, also see in the increased expression of neuropeptides while involved in feral populations. But it's here in Trinidad that we are really excited about. It's been termed a natural laboratory. And it's sort Specifically, of forward now, the northern coming back to this idea of plasticity. Um, so all we know the river that most rather. of these frogs uh, have these like northern defined. So if we zoom in on what they use, or um, we also know that drainages will have this very classic in setup that I'm sure. So in this example, the underbaited um, forest, which has lower elevations um, and higher frogs, the species that many have are classically the top. They're typically male and parental. Here, got the dad is the one performing the predators that are very intense on them. But sometimes, um, under some streams, there are waterfall uh, barriers that, take, uh, that the predators and so we have cross sex to the so upstream of these barriers. We have what are classically referred to. So there's some flexibility, some plasticity here. And here, the and more or less thought was, a good oh, this is super great. And so we can um, use this. It's to been known to for tease many, to dive many deeper into years, this, decades, what's sex uh, that what this has given rise to is repeated evolutionary changes and parallel um, adaptive phenotypes. So, and, and because the thing that we working on is that we said, okay, well, we're going to look in the we have a really good case sense of what the adaptive at what are the mechanisms are driving this behavior, behavior morphology, so we're start by looking at some hormones. So, for me, a great place to start. So, the background data that I'm going to show you, so we're going to have log, and then we also know from the genetics that these are repeated pollinization. Groups, no so it's care, always a high predation transport um, source um, population yes. colonizing. And then I want to point out, I'm going to show you males rather than and females. Like lateral so this is the sex typical condition. And so, so it's in essence, then like a natural dad is parental, mom is typically not parental. Um, um, what we, we then know who mom did because more recently is part of the um, cares. And so we were interested in comparing the non collection of labs sex. working on this from different angles. So was to take advantage of a breeding so design to try to tease apart this. So okay. this is cortisol this that I'm showing you here. Sort of um, <coughs> trait <coughs> evolution, how much of that is actually and genetic an increase, and how much of it um, is, during is plastic is environmentally um, mediated. Transporting males. And so to do this, we bring in fish from the wild. So every river drainage, this is a pattern that we actually brought Basically, because we have to high to low effort, so this made a lot of sense. We can but bring in these two populations. So we also see a clear increase um, we in rear them out for two generations partners. to try and control as okay. best we can for maternal what and about environmental effects. And then we split um, when the blue bars are higher than the yellow bars into rearing environments with and sex differences in testosterone. So this is essentially um, a two by two design. And then we see a decrease in testosterone so you end up with during four parental and uh, group in essence. So when I use this is the word also group in line throughout the top, this is what I refer to parental effort that um, occurs in many. I want to just breathe so again. Out, okay, what do I mean by these we also <laughs> saw so we have the fish in these females. circulating water systems. We also so there's a sump tank down here, and water is right? constantly moving through not these doing smaller tanks behaviorally. And in the, um, um, and then finally in estradiol, a um, cyclic we saw and sex difference. And it gets fed um, up these daily estradiol in so females from birth and males, out but their no lives throughout the duration of this experiment. Care. These guppies um, in the predator treatment are constantly being exposed to chemical cues um, from the predator directly, and we think also um, from the predator uh -huh. eating their buddies, basically. Um, so what are they doing? Are they exposed? And so how do we interpret this then? So if we compare um, animals, so they're like that hanging are out. They're in the same in the same rearing environment. So this is like a classic common garden kind of design. We assume most right. of the so they're in the terrarium, um, but they're not actively performing this tadpole and then by contrast, behavior. If we compare, and they're not also um, doing siblings, any, any sort of split into these different rearing environments, we assume that most of them are around. Yeah, and so we can come back to this because I have not. 
not perfect. They're not so formal, one of our suspicions um, but was we do have this okay. Nice, uh, split right, maybe design, it's so we can like your partner starts um, acting crazy and carrying tadpoles around, and you're responding and then so, to the partner. So we for sure that's one of the things that, that we were curious about. But I will also point out there. it's important that uh, these animals are not care bonding. Um, so have she's there, the but like they don't bond with each other as far as we can tell. Like if they're history, they're not that interested in the specific identity of their genetic male and development, and that's corroborated by field data. So this was. Super exciting. But so I think we can come back to this. Also, studies here are largely relevant like sort of for animal level story. traits. But for me, I was also starting so in grad school at a really summer, exciting we were somewhat surprised time because, because we thought like, all the females the aren't actively doing this behavior. We didn't exploding. expect to see and so this, someone like, parallel about about underlying and their hormones, but who likes funny critters. Okay, so what about this great gene expression? So we did a really similar thing in terms of this kind of analysis about plasticity and this is a little bit of an aggressive visualization. It takes a ton of time, right? So we've got a different to measure color, to measure shoaling behavior. And then at the end of that, you sort of have like one and trait to transport these patterns. The genes that are large, of course, to hear thinking of upregulated and genes as trait to egg pair types is upregulated and egg pair relative. But no pair is cool because it lets us think about how all I really need to recognize here is that there are not a lot of differences between egg pair and no pair, but there's a lot of differences between tadpole transport and we can argue later about genes as traits, but so this. That's what well I'm with the, the rest data. of the data um, I'm going to show you in terms of the copies is cool. sort of using And then we also saw this really parallel patterns. pattern in the females. If anything, there so is the first more study that I want to show you is one that um, um, I was involved in, though it was an expression response sort of directly in part of my work. And so looking here again, specifically this was at rapid evolution not what we expected. So what do I mean by this? Right. So here's our basic setup, remember. So just to summarize, what I just showed you, we found these experimental introductions testosterone where high predation fish from this source were Testosterone to different locations in the low predation environment, fathers, and they were monitored in their non in these earliest stages partners. of adaptation. <laughs> um, and then we see this really similar, uh, and then we asked about gene expression, non adaptive, where the differences um, are most pronounced gene expression during transport, and that's a male gene expression, expression in relation to So, to um, summarize this, then, adaptation, hormonal and brain gene expression patterns in parental males are mirrored in their non So, to be able to do this, and for sure, there are other things we thought of, like brain interaction. And looked at gene expression. Um, and the first thing we did was to compare cycling. Um, could be playing some pairwise comparisons. So we also have still our ancestral high predation population. Not we have the long expected. established. So we low thought, oh, we're going to map out these male and female. And then we have these two and then we're going to look at transporting which are females a year and figure into out if the mechanism is shared. But right now, there's like no by overlapping males and females. Even though there's a few behavioral which genes are always so different. Be, yeah. Between yeah. high and low, um, and yes, there is a hundred. Yes, because six of them, as it turns out, <laughs> correct. Um, yeah, this they not seem like they are the mothers, mothers which we way know more because we have them expected by chance. In the lab. And but so in the wild, the was like, the okay, these are the genes that always way. change in response to being um, in a low predation okay, environment. So um, from a genetic standpoint, we said, well, even given this surprising result, we can also look at so what can we say then about what females and try to figure out what. Going on, and so to induce this sex and reverse so behavior, the way I'm going to um, show you know this data, data make it more likely by two more times male the top, So I want to orient you really and clearly. So we did that, so and I'm then we all basically uh, going to plot. So now I'm going to show you the expression changes, being my um, yellow color scheme, and adding or transcript hair giving. And so basically, we've got on the y-axis of all of the expression transport. So this is we're asking this by looking. So the first thing we did is looked at hormones, the different populations, females. So these are females that also have hatched tadpoles. And then we're going to compare that to also have their main divergence, but did so not thinking about what happens with transport. the ancestral They're population when they time of with day and age of tadpoles, um, and then females that Ooh, did perform um, this parental um, behavior. And, and so, so we don't see any differences, differences that fall here. along this um, axis. Those are transcripts on its own, that are either I would have found surprising, but given that we already saw in both hormonal cases, shift, but they're in moving in the same parental female, direction genetically, basically what this indicated to us and so this is well, how we're having an additional change that we assume um, these are this so represents adaptive. Maybe processes. that makes sense. And then by that, contrast, because it seems going like on other diagonal, um, the they're moving in opposite part. directions, and so um, we interpret this as And then the other thing we did, uh oh, I have this circle. And here so, what do we actually see if we plot these 136? Um, so, the other thing that we did is to actually look now at the neural adaptation. And so, we have a pretty standard way that we've been doing this in our lab, which is true from the statistical assay that there's way more stuff. 
um, on this so diagonal. Get so there's the strong signature of non um, and tag them with this antibody in these um, genes. The readout of that looks like this. So there's the light purple cells. So this is super exciting. Um, we were very excited about this. And then the one of brown in general is non adaptive. And so I can basically count brown to as a proxy for recent neural activity environments. Um, and so and I should also say that but one of the reasons guppies were so awesome for this is because um, we know that they are very in these rapidly different brain regions. Like they are if these really words mean something to you, that's great. If they, they don't, don't worry about it. And I'm just putting so the quickly. schematic here to point out to you so that we know where different brain um, regions are. A study um, a that I was involved in early on, and then in the bulk of my dissertation work, I felt like, okay, well, there's two other good ideas about what they're for. One is. Well, what about and longer time scales, right? Now, is some there data fundamentally different about rapid adaptation, adaptation versus adaptation one of the core parent adaptation that's happening that we found? Um, um, many generations and out. I'll also just tell you what pattern I'm going to show you is pretty similar ages. across a number because of here, even though we had multiple populations, so they're all coming the from the same source. Activity. So it's so a single genetic lineage. This is what we knew lineage, already before um, in our multiple sex typical case, where during this tadpole transport behavior, we had a big increase so in neural activity. So I took advantage of the males, same experimental um, design that I've no already told you. In my case, I took case males, specifically males, not providing care. Data I'm not showing you we found for the discuss with anyone. I also looked that we I saw that a parallel in behaviors only in those females exhibit provide like courtship and aggression. So here now, and then I collect the level brain of neural activity. Brain we are seeing what we know about transcriptomes where this increase is tightly linked to the actual so here performance is a guppy of brain on a penny, just to give you a sense of the <laughs> right. massive so tissues that let me then zoom back out and summarize. So the first thing I did was again what I've shown you and tell you some standard kind of differential gene expression analysis. So again, the hormonal and brain expression two drainages um, um, in oh, males were mirrored in so their two drainages, not just one. So so there's sort of this disconnect between active okay. performance. So some and number of genes are differentially expressed mean, based on um, population underlying mechanism. Not surprising. In contrast, what we saw for neural activity, and I've only shown you mental data, but this is not surprising. Right? What I really wanted to know is is there a relationship between these two things? Um, is that neural so activity lab means more um, there are some genes that active differentially expressed based on both transport. influences. And, and so what we think is happening more here overlap is than that, expected um, by chance. This is related um, to females so monitoring of their partner behavior and their ability to actually some non-dependent take on whether you end up different types of the genetic hair and or or arisal of plastic. So in essence, what we now think is that so what about the hormonal? So I'm going to show you the gene expression in a similar way, even when females don't perform care because they they look like priming them. And now what you can probably and so coming back is to where I started, it's not looking like there's a pattern here, and that is in fact true. This sort of makes you wonder. How does that inform our understanding of how behaviors diverge and across these hierarchical um, levels in the nervous system? Differences. And so once again, asking, the heck, well, right, is there more so flexibility Like three minutes ago, I just told you. Not so I think this then really relates really back also to this like, question. Oh, there's no guppies. Um, is part of the reason what's going on? Flexibility okay. and so what's the main difference here? Because we have this, this sort of data set on the left, map map rapid adaptation data set level, you can sort of basically three dial to four the knobs around a year after and have multiple Whereas on the right hand side, that these are high and low predicting more errors that are long at this higher level. So we're output. looking at something like and so that's something that I have been thinking about. More recently, and so what I think is cool excited here about, and that, that I think that it's a this cool suggests time that maybe the role of adaptive that we versus now not adaptive are having a various kinds of techniques skills. that I think are going to let us think about this, there's actually more explicitly made relatively intuitive levels, that at the earliest stages, the really non adaptive responses, there is hard selective pressure to move those really get the optimum. But as you get rid of those most extremely non adaptive phenotypes, you might lose um, that. And so, kind with of that, if this sounds interesting to and you, the reason that um, I think this is also right, particularly well, already said that this, but I'm starting there's a lot of debate um, surrounding why and so it's still important and adaptive or non adaptive. And there's back, so examples of such things in the literature. Um, and then I want to end and by so also thanking the members of I the O'Connell Lab, um, especially Lauren, where I've been doing my postdoc. Um, and then the members of the Hoke Lab, some of whom you may recognize. Um, <laughs> this is a somewhat outdated photo. Um, our funding sources, also many, many frog and fish lab helpers who help keep our animals happy and healthy, and you for your attention. And I'm curious, maybe there's plenty of keepers on this already, but what's the role of population size and generation time and whether or not non-adaptive plasticity 
option to adapt it. Um, like I, yeah, so I think the thing is that like we don't know. Um, so there's like lots of theory on this stuff, but I think empirically, like I would say that as I'm aware, though other people who work on plasticity, correct me if I'm wrong, there aren't studies that have really systematically looked at it. And so right, I presented one idea that time scale might matter, but I think we're now at this stage where like the empirical data is showing, oh, both things appear to be true. And so like given that, my supposition is that they're both true, but not in like a random way, and that there are these other influences that drive like their relative importance. And so, yeah, like that would be another thing to try to explicitly test like is population size also relevant, or to think about these other variables. Um, and I think most of the time people go in and like do the study whenever they're like doing it and not really taking those kinds of things into account. Um, I also had a question about the guppies. So, <laughs> is there any data suggesting that when you go from, you're transported from a high predation spot to a low predation spot, that there's maladaptive behavioral responses? Yeah, so I actually, um, so I didn't show this data, but even from my lab populations, like when you take a low predation fish and put it in high predation environments, those are clearly like the most, I mean, I'm totally going to anthropomorphize, but they seem like they have just no idea what's going on. Um, like, they just don't know what to do. Um, so we think there's also some, like, sort of releasing of hidden genetic variation there when they get into the stressful environment. So you see way more variability in behavior, and some of it's adaptive, but some of it is, like, clearly not. It's just, like, they don't know what to do, and they're a little bit all over the place. Um, and for some of the morphological and like life history traits, we also see that there's sort of this expansion, um, like this hidden genetic variation that we suddenly can see, mm -hmm. and so we think that then selection can act on it to like reduce that back down. <coughs> and so that's sort of a like a whole another area where there's also a lot of interesting theory and some cool data that's like I don't know related, but somewhat to the left of this plasticity question. Right. Um, whereas the high predation fish going to a non-predation environment, you also see like somewhat of an expansion, um, but it's like less extreme, or they don't go like all over the place. Um, and so the idea there is, right, like this is related to sort of like the stressfulness, I guess, of, of that environment, perhaps. So you might, whether or not that kind of a pattern would hold for something that's not as like clearly, I don't know, stressful, or like the cost to doing it wrong is not as high as being eaten, um, yeah. yeah, I think it's less, like, obvious. Yeah, but, like, a lot of the non-adaptive plasticity and the gene expression stuff that's going from high predation to low predation, or is it... Right, yeah, 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 sure, okay. so that's it, right, okay, like, cool. is that still happening then on a smaller scale, or is gene expression, like, fundamentally different? I, yeah. <laughs> I had a question about the frogs. You said they might multiply, the females multiply mate in the wild, um, but you said in captivity you thought they might be priming to take over the parental care. Is that something they do? Are they monitoring like these multiple males in the wild to make sure like all of them are doing their jobs? They don't have to jump in? Um, or is that yeah, like a so specific to captivity? I will respond to that in two ways. The first is that in this particular species, the reason we got started on this whole track was that we like anecdotally, or we had like a one-off where we found this female transporting. And in that case, it was a very like older experienced female and a quite young male. And all frogs are like bad parents the first few rounds, like they let their eggs die, they let their tadpoles dry out. I'm not sure how they're learning to be better parents, but they're somehow doing this. And so this sort of got us thinking, that, I mean, again, right, it was easy to sort of envision this as her being like, are you not going to do this? Fine, I'll, I got it. Um, <laughs> but in another species, which is also male uniparental, which some colleagues of ours work on, they are strongly suspicious that the females are monitoring the calling behavior of their male partners. So even though they're like multiply mating, they're like, okay, I know I mated with him, I hear him over there, so that seems to be fine. Like, I hear him over there, this guy, 
haven't heard him in a while, um, and then they'll like go in and perform the behavior. But the species also vary in how flexible they appear to be with this. So in some species, we don't think there's any sex reversal, and in other species, they appear to be really reliable in performing the behavior. So that's also a thing that I think is really interesting, like why are some species more flexible or plastic than others? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, sorry. I've been going, I've been uh, to NPC talks for a very long time now, and I've never seen something distinctive to my, my mind of what you, you incorporated serious studies focused on one idea on, uh, you know, more than one class. <laughs> and uh, they all have I'm brains, just saying so that's a source out. of great help for this organization. This is my view, and I, I hope others might share that too. Of, you know, we have the question is driving it, and we have, uh, you know, more than one possibility, and it might not even be narrowly taxonomically defined, which the NBC got its reputation over its taxonomy and systematics and so on. So I thought that was a very interesting oh. <laughs> aspect here. But uh, what I also had a question. So in the natural world, those frogs, the uniparental types mm -hmm. or biparental, that in the natural world, that could be flowing back and forth. Their frequency, it sounds to me like, if you looked over, you know, 10 or 100 generations, then, oh, it's about even now. And so there must be environmental circumstances that are somehow driving that whole system. Yeah. That, yeah. So good? there um, are cool studies on what are the ecological factors that drove this. So male uniparental care is ancestral in the clade. Um, and the idea is that we get to the female uniparental over the biparental care. Um, and I mean, once you're female, once you have egg feeding or lactation, as in mammals, you can't really get rid of mom. So that's kind of like a one-way dead-end street. Um, but I also, I mean, there's like one kind of anecdotal report in the wild that some of these populations may also have some plasticity, where like they're sometimes bi and sometimes uniparental. Um, we know there's a few transitions to the biparental care, um, so that's been mapped on the phylogeny. But one to get at this question of what are the ecological variables, um, there is evidence that um, pool size is related to care type. So for the so the the frog I showed you puts their tadpoles in like medium sized pools. Um, the egg care ones where I showed you the begging, they put their tadpoles in very tiny pools. And this is super awesome because they are free of predators, but they're also really resource depleted environments. And so the idea is that maternal care basically co-evolved with this ability to exploit a safe but nutrient poor environment. And um, Kyle Summers uh, has done really lovely work like showing that pool size correlates well with care type. So that's one specific environmental variable. And that's also why sort of even more broadly zooming out of poison frogs, we think that they evolved parental care to be able to lay terrestrial eggs because fish predators um, are a major problem for, for frogs and larger bodies of water or also as are insect larvae, dragonfly larvae. So if you can get them out of the water, that's good for your egg survival, it seems like. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the males that you removed um, from the, the mating pairs uh -huh. um, to induce the female yeah. parental care. After they were removed um, from their whole like mating couple parental care situation, did they still exhibit signs of wanting to give parental care? Um, I don't know. I mean, we like put them in a different tank, uh, and we didn't monitor them further. Like, it would be interesting to know: are they stressed by knowing that they're not there to transport their tadpoles? Um, I mean, I think that's plausible. We haven't looked yet at all. I have had debates. Maybe this is this is like tangential, but yeah, true to like academic form, I'll answer you a question you didn't ask. Um, <laughs> So again, in this other species, uh, the one of my um, the other postdocs in our lab has done a lot of homing experiments, and the males are better at homing than the females, and so 
we have this debate between the two of us all the time where I think like part of that might be motivation. Like they, the males want to get home to transport their tadpoles and defend their territories, whereas the females are like, whoa, here seems good too, right? Like whatever. So we haven't looked explicitly, but I think that they, the males, I assume they're motivated by the parental care, by the investment they've already put in. I, I had a question about the, I have a lot of questions, but I get to you <laughs> later. <laughs> this is really fun. The, um, about the fish, though, and the comparison you made, where in one case you saw non-adaptive plasticity, mm -hmm. groups, sort of primarily, and in the other you, you, you didn't, um, you emphasized the difference in time scale. Yeah. Um, but in the first case, you had selected the genes that you're comparing, it's 136 genes, were ones that that overlapped between right. the ancestral and then each Yeah, the, yeah. So we have and, stronger, and so the, yeah. And whereas have, in the second case, you're just looking at all the expression differences, whether or not they're, they're yeah. adaptive. Yeah, so, sorry, I should have said this. So, well, there's two pieces. One is we do have, because we have that within lineage um, repeatedness in that first case, we have stronger evidence for the adaptive plasticity. Um, I also, I, sh I showed for the second case, all the genes that diverged um, based on genetics, which is the larger set, not just the overlapping set. The pattern is the same in the smaller overlapping set, and that was where we started. But then we sort of thought, well, it's not that many genes, and if we're talking about you know, probability of direction, let's look also in this larger set. The rationale sort of being that even if you don't have differential expression for um, based on rearing environment, could the direction you start out in still somehow inform our, our understanding of whether those genes are then the ones that are selected on where we see the genetic divergence. But So even if I restrict to the set, the pattern is the same. Um, which I did, because I really wanted there to be a pattern, but there wasn't. <laughs> but the, the two lineages that you were comparing were really different in terms of, one differed by hundreds of genes, the other differed by thousands of genes. Yeah, and so that um, we think is, so, those data sets were collected at slightly different times. There were definitely technological advances in the interim. We don't think that that's the case. Like we did all sorts of checks. Our sequencing seems good, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so then I thought like, what, this is so weird. But if you look at the FST estimates actually between those populations, the one with fewer genes also um, has, is like less recently diverged did I just say that was a yeah. lot of double negatives? Right. So I think that may be related, is what I'm trying They're to say, younger. to actually genetic divergence between those lineages where one is an older colonization event. Um, so that jives with other people's microsat data on, on divergence between the high and low pairs, even within a drainage. I have about 10 other questions, but I'll <laughs> save it for when we get to meet. Any other questions? I was just curious why you chose um, the guppy fish, the guppy brains to sequence. Why, why that tissue? Oh, because I was really interested in the behavior, and so um, I didn't show you all the behavioral data, but I basically also, you know, I'm trying to link specifically the gene expression to the behavior, and so then the brain is an obvious choice. But for sure, looking at other tissues um, could be really interesting, or um, you know, I think it would also be interesting to know, like, is the brain a special place? Um, and would liver give us a really different kind of answer? Um, and also, I mean, what I will say about the brain is that, like, the brain is also transcriptionally very complex. So I did not choose the easiest, perhaps, starting point, right? So, like, brains express, like, 80, 70 to 80 percent of all genes, like, in a single neuron. And so you're, like, it's not easy entry. I think the patterns, like in terms of dealing with like noise or variation, could also be less in a in a transcriptionally less complex tissue. So, yeah, worth probably like maybe I should have looked at livers or something, muscle. <laughs> anyway, yeah, thank you. Let's thank our speaker one more time.